And now it's time for Crocheting with Ron. Wait, that can't be right. Now it's time for cro Oh, okay, okay. Now it's time for Crotchety Old Ron. That makes much more sense. You're listening to The Ron Van Dam Show on New England Broadcasting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It's The Ron Van Dam Show. Thank you very much. Hold on tight, things can get a bit weird if you like that sort of thing. Welcome to the program of Enormous Proportions, which also describes me. <laughs> it's the Ron Van Dam Show. I am Ron Van Dam, and this is the show. I am the person to whom they refer to in the title of the damn thing. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for stopping by. Make yourself comfortable. This is going to be interesting. I know that uh, for a while we've been trying to stay six feet apart. Now I am thinking of about ten miles. How about that? All right. All right. That'll be enough. That'll be enough. Well, uh, thanks for stopping by and checking in and uh, making sure I'm okay. I appreciate that. I am okay. I know that's not why you stopped by. But nonetheless, you know, if we all checked in on each other, this world would be a much more annoying place than it already is. Uh, It's true, and you know it. Yes, love and fellowship. I remember those good theories Didn't work out. Good idea to begin with, but didn't go well. Didn't go well at all. Anyway, uh, I have a very interesting show for you today, and I hope that you're appreciative of it. Uh, Today, I am going to talk to a couple of ladies who are much more intelligent than I am. I know many of you are saying that isn't really saying very much. No, it's not. Uh... But, nonetheless, uh, I have a very interesting show. Uh, this is about the, uh, the many sightings that people have been having in disguise. Not in disguise wearing a, uh, one of those phony uh, uh, glasses with the nose attached and the mustache. Not that kind of disguise. The skies up above. There have been numerous upon numerous sightings of uh, unidentified flying objects, things that we see up there that we can't explain what they are. Pilots and people of of great stature are basically saying, uh, we're seeing weird things in, in the air. We don't know what they are. Strange craft that can do things that our aircraft can't possibly do. It's not possible. This has been going on for decades and decades and decades, actually since the 40s. But now, with the onslaught of the video cameras and technology, uh, we're having trouble trying to explain these things. They're not all uh, weather balloons, as the government used to call them. So what's going on? Uh, Are there beings from another world that are spying upon us? Uh, Are these are these from other countries spying upon us, or are these is this phenomenon that we can't explain coming from another dimension? Are my shoes getting too tight? Am I seeing things that aren't there, or am I all of a sudden seeing things that are there and I don't know what they are? Well, recently, the United States government, remember them? Uh, They released statements and videos of uh, unidentified flying aerial objects that they're admitting, we don't know what they are. I can't explain them away, the government says, because we don't know. Does it make us nervous? Does it make us inquisitive? Yeah, both those things, I suppose. So today, these uh, these two scientists and experts are going to tell us what's going on with the releasing of all these videos and pictures of things that the government can't even explain. What's going on up there? 
uh, fascinating stuff. So uh, that'll be the crux of our show today. I don't know what crux sounds like something that uh, remains on your body and you need to shower to get it off. I woke up this morning. I'm all cruxy. There's crux all over me. Take a shower. Take a shower. Anyway, um, that's what we're doing. I mean, that's what I'm doing. Uh, we might as well get right to our guest because this is, this is pretty awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, speak to our guest right now. Good morning. Well, it's good to have you all here. Uh, Dr. J.C. Vandenberg is here. Great. Good to speak to you. And also uh, Deborah LaPrevot. Is that correct? Very good. Thank you for being here. Both of you are uh, have impressive backgrounds, uh, molecular physiology, biophysics, things I don't even understand. Uh, 20-year veteran of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Both of you have some great credentials. We're talking about something that has reach the the interest of of just about every living person on the planet and that's uh, all those ufo sightings that we're familiar with that are never talked about or in the past just uh, written off as as a lot of hot air balloons going on a lot of weather balloons well now uh images have been released reports have been released and we're turning to the both of you to help us understand what that is about let me start by asking we're not talking about flying saucers necessarily are we that is correct. Um, we are really talking about observations of things that are unexplained. Mm-hmm. And that can be anything. Um, we're seeing objects that we just cannot explain. Right. And it's really looking at patterns of that and how many people and how many different places these things are occurring. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, um, the 1950s saucer right you know that that used to used to be captured it's really a myriad of objects there there has been a history of seeing objects in the sky that later turned out to be military testings and and thus used uh stealth bomber for example and and many other uh military technology air technologies that now we're familiar with but at that time we thought were unidentified flying objects to the public, and the government, of course, never responded to those. Is that what we're talking about, or is it beyond that? It's, it's really could be both, uh-huh. in fact, because the thing is that when you have something that's unknown, yes. you really need to figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, 100% of everything isn't going to turn out to be something that you expect it to be. Right. You're going to have some stuff that eventually in time you're going to figure out, oh, that was an advanced technology that we just didn't, we weren't privy to the knowledge on. Um, but it, that in itself is incredibly important for us to know, mm-hmm. especially when our government is um, releasing a report saying they don't even know what this stuff right. is. So we have no idea if it is an advanced technology that could pose a national security threat. Right versus something that is just unknown beyond our current physics. Mm-hmm. And that that is something that is, is very critical to what we're looking at these days and how the field has shifted, that we may have something that's just beyond our understanding and something that is uses physics that are beyond our current knowledge. It, it, it was Does amazing. Does that on what Jennifer just Yes, right? go on. To dovetail onto what Jennifer just said, whatever the phenomenon are, they're being photographed and captured, mm-hmm. the images are being captured all over the world, yes. which would seem to limit that it's one country's technology. Yes. Yeah, possibly. Um, and that's the, the greatest concern, I guess, that we have is that uh, it, it could be something that is, that is threatening from, from another country. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's national security. Uh, I mean, national security is a paramount um, importance, and one of the reasons that G2P, the Genesis 2 Project, is focusing on the scientific approach to identifying mm-hmm. or understanding what is being captured, both in digital and photographic uh, medium. But 
to go back to the fact that it's being, uh, these images are being captured in yes. multiple locations all over the world, it would indicate that uh, I mean, it's very unlikely that a foreign government is testing this technology over U.S. Uh, right. airspace. airspace. Right. Uh, so, so that leaves the door open for even more questions, I, I, I suppose. What, what astounded me the most were the eyewitness reports of, of uh, military and, and uh, uh, pilots and, and, and top experts uh, in the field who, who actually witnessed some of these things themselves. Uh, and that they happen, I think one of the pilots said, this happens on a daily basis. It's every day we see these. Um, that was kind of shocking. Yes. And that's really what we have seen over this. We've, we've had a focused four-year data collection effort on UAP, documented UAP. Mm-hmm. And we are seeing that this is a daily occurrence. And this is happening with witnesses from the average citizen, such as, um, well, I'm not at liberty to give any names, right. but um, a licensed helicopter pilot or a high school teacher mm-hmm. versus people that are very high level in, mm-hmm. the, in their field, pilots, um, military people. And, and all of these people are seeing stuff consistently and persistently. Yeah. Um, I would venture to say that that's one of the reasons the Pentagon put out its report uh-huh. is that these, uh, whatever they are, are being captured uh, digitally and in video all over the world on a daily basis, uh-huh. and that the the mounting amount of data being provided or being captured around the world is getting to a point where it's not the 1950s one person had a blurry photograph. Uh-huh. And that's the beauty of where we're at right now, because the thing is that, you know, previously there were, there were people who had had, um, they had observed unexplained phenomena, but really at that point it was largely people sharing by word of mouth. And at that point you don't have any data. You just have someone telling you something that they experienced. Right. And so really your focus at that point just naturally is on the person and the story that they're telling, not actually what happened to right. them or what they observed. Right. And now with this increase in our technology, really all of us, almost every single one of us, is carrying around a camera and a video recording device with us every single day. And I remember having read an article, I think it was in 2019, where they were saying 1.8 billion new images are uploaded every single day. And so now now that we have this technology in our hands and people are actually documenting, they're able to document what they're seeing, there's also, you can't discount that the advances in our videographic and photographic technology the advances that we have now are in our industry. So our military jets have more advanced um, mm-hmm. uh, technology in order to cover, to capture yes. things that they see, as well as even, you know, our the different commercial industries. And at that point now, we have a critical mass of data. And so that's, that's the point that we're at, and that's where G2P is so excited to be entering this field, is that really... We have evidence now that we never had before, and we have data that we've never had before, which can now be assessed scientifically rather than just as a story someone is telling. Interesting. Uh, what what would, what would one do with with this this uh, data? Uh, what, I, I know that there's uh, there are committees uh, that are involved, but they're not the experts. So, what does one do with it? Well, I think with with any data in science, there's always a, there's always great potential with it. Mm -hmm. You typically start assessing a piece of data or an observation um, to, to follow a certain path that you're, you're interested in, you're thinking about, which would be, of course, we're thinking with technology, with um, vehicles, with uh, how things move. And however, as you get information and findings from scientific study, you start to understand how those things are applicable to other fields. 
So, for example, in studying these UAP that, that are being documented, these UAP are really, they're, they're showing us movements that are beyond our physics. For example, the acceleration speeds are beyond anything that we know of. Right. Um, the directionality. So you have something going in a certain direction, and it will make a 90-degree angle turn in the right. blink of an eye. Right. We don't have, as far as we know, we don't have that capability. Right. And in, when you're studying this kind of stuff, if you could use the information over a long period of study, if you could use your findings, what you could do, for example, is you could um, you could apply those findings to reverse engineer, say, a, um, a material, a micro-material. And that micro-material could be used in the human body for a, some kind of therapy. So really, in the study of these things, whatever they turn out to be, then we will be getting new knowledge. And new knowledge is always good because when you have innovative thinkers in all different fields, they're able to recognize how that new knowledge is going to be able to be applied to their field and to benefit their field. Interesting. Uh, th- th- there are there are two things working against each other, and I want to see if, if you fall in, in a category or if that's possible. Uh, one is that because we do all have cell phones and we have pictures readily available, we don't have to carry cameras around with us. They're, they're always with us. That that's why there are so many more images, um, because when sightings occurred in the past, there was no way to document them. As as you said, they were just uh, witnesses, and that was that was that. So my question is: Are there indeed more, or are we able to see more that was that were that was always there, but we had no way of getting it to this to this level as far as discussion or proof is concerned? Also, on the other end of technology. Every, every consumer has the ability to Photoshop pictures. Um, of course, eyewitness-wise, that's a different situation, but there can be a lot of that as well. So, I mean, which way, is, is it both ways, or which, which way is this going? Well, with your, your first question, that's kind of the, the million-dollar question mm-hmm. there. Um, how would we know that? Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, you would. it is possible that, that we are just capturing more, that this really has been going on to the same extent Mm -hmm. this whole time, but now we're able to capture it. That's that's a very, very likely possibility. Um, The second thing that you brought up is very interesting, and that is something that we're very concerned with at G2P, and that's why we have structured, we very carefully structured our scientific approach Mm -hmm. to address that as well. And so with with the GTP, we're really unique in the way that we approach this scientifically Mm -hmm. from a bona fide, empirical scientific approach. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the very first step that we follow with any documentation that we're presented with is to have it digitally, forensically assessed. Mm -hmm. And we use the most, one of the most reputable um, teams in the nation that work with our court systems, they work with the government, they work with the FBI, they work with police departments all across the nation. And what they do is they do forensic analysis of the digital image itself. And there's really two parts of that that they're looking at. This is the very first step, is that they're looking at, was the image manipulated? Is there any digital signature of photoshopping or even subtle enhancement, Mm -hmm. you know, like that, that is considered manipulation. And that would be like if you took a selfie and the the light was a little low, but you wanted to kind of change the light to bring out your face a little bit more. That is still manipulation. Mm -hmm. So we need to ensure that these are the original photos and that these are photos or videos that they really represent what was captured, Mm -hmm. what the image captured. And the second part of that is that it has to look at and see if the object that's in, the object of interest that is in the photograph or the video, if that is actually just an artifact of the technology itself. We need to rule that out. Mm-hmm. Is this a lens flare from the sun? Um, you know, and so so there's there's really those, those are 
sort of the two key pieces. There's other parts that come into this, and I won't bore you with the details. Well, but it's important <laughs> also to say that what digital forensic analysis does is it doesn't tell you what something is. Mm -hmm. It's not going to interpret what they find. Right. It is strictly looking at the actual evidence and making sure of its integrity and its authenticity. At that point, then, we're able to move forward with something as a bona fide piece of data. Okay. Um, as far as this government is concerned and other governments around the world, uh, it has always been the policy to explain it away as something simple so that you would say, okay, never mind. I, I uh, Thank you for, the, for explaining it. Um, that seemed to... Uh, with this, th these these revelations, these reports, it seems that they gave up on on explaining things away, whether they could explain them away or not. In other words, explanations were were given for things that they didn't have explanations for. It was in order to make the public feel like, okay, no, it's not a big deal here. What, what I, th I think you addressed this somewhat before, but uh, what, what what where was that shift? When did that shift take place? Where all right, we admit it. We don't know what these things are. We're not going to make excuses anymore. I think that falls back into the um, the aspect of it's being captured in so many areas by so many people every day that, that there's no longer yeah. the ability mm -hmm. to um, sweep it under a rug. Yeah, but but they but they wanted to sweep it under a rug, and I don't understand why they did. The U.S. government, you know, it's always a very interesting thing. The, the first thing is that if it is, uh, since they may or may not know what it is, the yeah. first thing they want to do is figure out what it is and whose technology, if it's not our technology, whose technology is it, right. and what threat, if any, does it um, apply to the United States. Right. So I think it's not so much that they want to sweep it under the rug as to put security of the, of the U.S. first. Right. And by doing so, they say... That, of course, we need to know what we're talking about before we I share guess. that information. Yeah. And I think until recently, and even currently, we still don't know what we're looking at. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it seemed to me that, that the secrecy was, was the blanket uh, answer that, no, that's probably ours, but we can't tell you about it because that's top secret and we're working on it and uh, we, we, can't, we can't discuss this. That was, that was my interpretation of, of all those responses. I, you know, I think initially, in some ways, that is probably true. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will tell you, with the data that uh, Jennifer and I have, and other people at G2P have gone through over yes. the last four years, yes. there are, it, it's not one or two uh, mm -hmm. types of UAP. There are a hundred. There's a variety of shapes, sizes, uh, yeah. uh, and, you know, whether it's the TikTok, whether it looks like a... Um, I mean, just something that, that shouldn't be flying, mm -hmm. something that seems to have no aerodynamic capabilities, right. and yet they're being captured photographically. Right. So there's the element there of it, it's not like we're just keeping a new bomber under wraps. Right. It's like this technology that's being captured is has such a depth of uh, variety yeah. that it, it just requires so much more investigation, and until we know what we're talking about, yeah. Uh, we'll just keep quiet. I, th I think it, that might be one aspect of it. Right. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's... But I think it also has reached the, cr the critical threshold with, with so much. And, you know, when you have so many people seeing something or experiencing something, there comes a time yeah. that, that as, a, as an agency, you have to address it. You can no longer just ignore it. Um, you know, and I think that we've we've reached that critical threshold yeah. with so many people documenting these things yes. and raising these questions, and with the myriad types of UAP that are being documented. Yeah. Then, really, it it the quandary came up that needed to be addressed. Of so many people are asking this question, so many people are bringing forth documentation of it. Yes. We really can't explain it by saying, oh, it's a weather balloon, because mm -hmm. a weather balloon would be have one shape, one type of movement, yep. Yep. and that is not what we have anymore. And then also, with that, 
with that mass of data and the mass of people coming forward and talking, there also becomes a almost a dangerous level when people just are speculating wildly, and then it becomes a conspiracy yes. theory. And that can be dangerous in itself, too. Yes. And so I think that the government has been pushed to a point mm. just by the mass of data itself that they have to address it, and they just have to say something. And at this point, I like the way that they said, you know, yes, some of it is explainable. We have looked into this. We are pretty sure it's this, mm. versus we have no idea what this is. Right. Well, and I think that that kind of transparency is important for putting people's minds at ease. Yeah. I think that's, that's sort of, that could be a strategy, um, yeah. you know, a governing strategy, well, the, but yeah. in a good way. I mean, the, and, the, the, these, yeah. are, these are supposed to be the days of, of transparency as opposed to uh, <laughs> the the, op- the conspiracy, which is what we went through for a period of time here. Uh, and you're right. I mean, the videos are very different than blurry single shot photographs very very different uh where where would people go to get more information to hear more about this um they could go straight to we we have a a website it's um www.genesis2project.com uh because we are a scientifically focused group Mm -hmm. then we typically we work with high level scientists um, and we are, you know, we're not here to just um, to just spread a, a conspiracy theory no. or, you know, we really, we're not here for popular media or just, um, you know, fluff. That's not what we're here for. Gotcha. And so really, when we release documentation, documented images, they have gone through digital analysis. They have been vetted. They have been authenticated. And so when we release information we release it very carefully and everything that comes out we don't just get something and release it to the public everything has already gone through that very first step many of the things that we have that are gone through that first step are not released either because at that point we need certain people that are in positions of power such as with the military because for example we have this one very compelling piece of data where you can see a uap going through a jet stream. So that is not that is not a bird flying in mm, front of the camera. Right. That is not something else, you know, that we can explain. There is something that is going through a jet stream and disrupting it. So from that our scientists are able to estimate size, estimate speed, because you have the plane going, we know that information. And so at that point, once we have scientists analyze it, and also figure things out on it that are useful, then we'll release that information as well. Very good. I I greatly appreciate uh, your your time. This has been fascinating. Well, there you have it. I I, I I don't know. Have you seen a lot of these videos? You can go online. You know what that online thing is. It's where you hang your laundry on a nice day. That's a clothing line. That's different. Hold on. A minute. Wait a minute. That's different. Go online on your computer, and you can see some of these videos. Some of them look very doctored up, but others are like, whoa. Uh, As I said during the interview, when this whole uh, UFO thing started with the flying saucers and everything, uh, there were pictures, and they were fuzzy, and we couldn't tell what they were. Now the clarity is incredible. They're witnessed by hundreds of people sometimes, uh, pilots, etc., experts, astronauts, they don't know. That, that's not supposed to be there. And they're performing like there's nothing we could have ever engineered. Interesting stuff. So we'll keep uh, tabs on, on that and see what's going on. I, you know, it's it's somewhat, I wouldn't say fun, but it's interesting to to look at things that are beyond our imagination, beyond our bil- our abilities, um, it's it's intriguing. It's just intriguing. Like it's like a it's like a mystery. What what are those things? What are they doing there? They apparently they actually exist, or at least we're really seeing them. I, I, I unless everybody who sees things in uh, odd things in the sky was on some type of an incredible drinking binge the night before 
just by chance and we're all seeing the same strange things because <laughs> because we're drunk. I don't think that's the case anymore. These sightings used to be from uh, people in trailer parks in Oklahoma and Mississippi, and I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying that's where you live in trailer parks, and you were the people that used to view these strange things in the night sky. Part of the reason was that the sky is very, very clear and unobstructed with city lights and street lights in those trailer park areas in Oklahoma where there's a tornado probably coming tomorrow the tornado alley place and we were all saying why are why are these extraterrestrials if there are any why are they visiting people in in trailer parks you're not getting a true representation of the people in this country but then there the sightings are over cities um uh in, in the skies uh, above uh suburbs i mean like whoa uh, whoa so Anyway, I hope that you uh, enjoyed the program today. I'm going to be back again tomorrow with a brand new show. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, you've been wonderful. You really have. I wish you peace. Peace.